All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. It is great to see another full house here for the uh, latest national security discussion here at the University of Texas, Austin. My name is Will Inboden. I'm honored to serve as the executive director of your sponsoring organization for today, the Clements Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft. But uh, nothing like this can come together just through one organization. And I want to thank a number of our co-sponsoring campus organizations who have enabled us to, to bring Senator Ayotte here today. That includes the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the LBJ School, AEI on Campus, the Alexander Hamilton Society, the LBJ Future Forum, College Republicans, International Relations and Global Studies Program, the International Affairs Society, and Women in Foreign Affairs. I probably should have just said there's only one campus organization that didn't co-sponsor, but anyway, I won't mention them. So, but I hope that full list shows you uh, just the, the level of commitment here at UT for serious discussions on foreign and defense policy. Um, so our, our guest today and featured speaker is Senator Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire. Uh, she is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and chair of the Subcommittee on Readiness. And she's rapidly become one of the most influential voices in the Senate, indeed in the country, on foreign and defense policy. Um, and she can regularly be seen uh, on the news, uh, chairing Senate hearings, and traveling internationally as she does uh, her part to help, uh, help the Senate play its role as one of the co-equal branches in governing our nation's national security. But for all of her many substantial accomplishments, uh, she's also widely seen as an ascendant star. And we trust that she has many years of continued leadership and national service ahead of her. So keep an eye on Senator Kelly Ayotte. You'll be hearing much more from her in, in future years. Um, on a personal note, I especially appreciate her service on the Clement Center's uh, Statecraft Board of Reference. And her home state is New Hampshire. Of course, we here are all residents and proud citizens of the great state of Texas. And a quick glance at the map or the, the thermometer in January will show you that our states are pretty different uh, in size and location and climate. But on a deeper level, I think our states share some important affinities, uh, some strong uh, values of hard work, entrepreneurship, liberty, and patriotism. Uh, as many of you know, New Hampshire's state motto is, is live free or die. Uh, it doesn't get much more clear or emphatic than that. And I think uh, someone from the, the live free or die state is most welcome in the home state of the Alamo. So with that, please join me in welcoming Senator Kelly Ayotte. So. Well, thank you so much. I'm really honored very much to be here today, uh, Professor Inboden. And uh, what a what a great uh, campus you have here, and a phenomenal program you have here at UT Austin. Um, I would very much like to thank uh, Chancellor Bill McRaven, uh, Admiral McRaven, for his incredible leadership to our country. And having had a chance to say hello to the Admiral before I came in here, you know, my first experience meeting him was, of course, as a new member of the Armed Services Committee, where he would have to appear, and we would ask him. Um, lots of questions uh, about his you know, important role as the commander of Special Operations Command. So you are so fortunate to have someone with such an amazing history of service to our country here today. And also, I understand you are very uh, fortunate to have Admiral Inman here, who also has an incredible uh, history of service uh, to our country. So as I look at the quality of people uh, that uh, you get to interact with on a regular basis, and also the people who have come to speak with you about national security matters. Uh, I think this is probably a fairly unparalleled education experience that you have here at UT Austin. And so um, just based on the group of students I had a chance to meet with briefly before I came in here, I said to all of them, uh, as someone like myself, who serves on the Armed Services Committee and the Homeland Security Committees in the Senate, uh, it's really uh, the type of uh, students and people that you graduate that are going to give uh, policymakers like me and others who are involved in governing the nation the type of expertise and advice that we need to make good decisions uh, in a very, very uh, challenging time in our, in our world. And if you look, as I understand you heard recently from Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, and he recently came before the Armed Services Committee, and what he had to say, in my view, was very telling in terms of the challenges we face around the world right now. Um, his so assessment was very sobering, in which he said, in my 50 plus years in the intelligence business, 
I don't know of a time that has been more beset by challenges and crises around the world. Uh, one of the things that I think demonstrates some of the uh, national security challenges that we face um, is the attack uh, on the Kenyan University that just happened, that where over 140 people uh, were murdered uh, in the last day by al-Shabaab, a terrorist group. And so that's a, a prime example of, of some of the groups that we face around the world, including al-Qaeda and ISIS, who remain active and are spreading throughout the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, and beyond. The conflict in Syria is, of course, uh, exacerbating the situation in Iraq and also causing further uh, destabilizing activity in Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, Yemen is immersed in an escalating civil war with very serious regional implications. And in fact, uh, I think what we see there at the moment, unfortunately, is somewhat of a, a Shia proxy uh, Sunni conflict with uh, Iran supporting the Houthi militias uh, that have overtaken the government. And of course, we've had to withdraw from Yemen, which is important for our national security because we were trying to ensure that we had some cooperation with the Yemen government in terms of the activities of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is headquartered in Yemen and is also the most deadly branch of Al Qaeda in terms of having ambitions and have made attempts on attacking the United States and its allies. And then you see the Sunnis. Uh, you see the Saudi, Saudi Arabia leading uh, a group of other Sunni nations to try to uh, get involved in the conflict in Yemen. And they are uh, very involved there now to try to prevent the continuing march of uh, the Houthis and the, the Shia militia in Yemen who have overtaken that government. So in Europe, we have our own challenges with Putin continuing his aggression against Ukraine. In the Asia Pacific, uh, China continues to aggressively pursue its territorial claims, uh, leading to tensions with other Asian Pacific powers, such as Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And having traveled to that region, uh, many of them are concerned about uh, their own territorial and uh, claims, and also making sure that the waters in that region remain free. And that is very important to our economy as well when we think about the trade uh, that we need to engage uh, with the Asia Pacific nations. And we can't have China dominating that area and, and making decisions on who can go where. Uh, but today, uh, I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one of our greatest uh, national security issues. And uh, you can imagine I had some comments planned and things have changed fairly quickly today uh, because one of the foremost uh, threats that the United States of America and our allies uh, face is the activities of Iran and Iran's drive to acquire nuclear weapons capability. And given today's announcement uh, and literally just recent announcement of a framework and the potential for an agreement with Iran, I'd like to focus my remarks today and talk to you a little bit about what's at stake in this agreement, uh, some, of, some of my initial thoughts. Uh, but please know that this is just the announcement of this agreement. We've only seen a framework. And I can assure you that whether uh, this is an agreement that ends up being an agreement that ends Iran's nuclear program, which is, in my view, where we need to be, a lot of this will uh, be determined by the details as this agreement unfolds so that we can understand how do we verify, uh, how do we ensure that whatever is agreed upon, uh, actually Iran follows through uh, on those agreements. Because the context of some of our challenges in these areas is if we look at, uh, for example, North Korea's acquisition of nuclear weapons, um, that came after long periods of negotiations where uh, North Korea had itself said that it would comply with uh, the non-proliferation treaty and then withdrew for it. So that's a history we do not want to repeat uh, with Iran's program and we cannot afford to repeat. 
And I'd like to start just with a little perspective of the challenging relationship that we've had with Iran. And it really goes back to 1979 and the Iranian Revolution, uh, where Iranians seized more than 50 American, American hostages at our embassy in Tehran, and of course held them hostage for over 440 days. And since then, Iran has uh, been a major player uh, when it comes to terrorism. And a lot of, and most of their terrorism is really carried out through proxies. And whether it's proxies like the Houthis in Yemen that they support through financial resources and arms and sometimes training on the ground. Uh, if we look back to our history with Iran uh, in the conflict that we had in Iraq, uh, Iran was very much responsible in terms of uh, helping produce IEDs that uh, murdered and maimed many of our soldiers. And if you see some of their historical activities, uh, we have had Iran designated as a state sponsor of terrorism since 1984. And even as this agreement has continued to be negotiated, which is now almost two years that these negotiations have been going on, Iran has really not let up on this uh, part of their activities that uh, undermine uh, stability in the region, which is very important to us. Iran has reportedly engaged in cyber attacks against American interests, and uh, we have American citizens uh, that are imprisoned in Iran, uh, including a Washington Post Tehran correspondent and a former Marine. Uh, we have also, they've continued to persecute their own people. Uh, one prominent example that we have, of course, decried on many occasions, rightly so, is Christian pastor uh, Saeed Abedini, who converted to Christianity, Christianity from Islam, and uh, he has been held uh, for years and tortured because of his change uh, in his religion, which of course in our country is sort of fundamental to what we believe in, that you should be able to practice whatever religion uh, you choose. And as they've really, one of their interests in the region is to dominate the region, and I think that's why you see uh, the Saudis and others right now acting in Yemen as they are, because they're very concerned about these attempts at regional domination. Uh, in fact, as we look at uh, the Middle East at the moment, you have Iran uh, involved in Iraq, of course, in trying to push back ISIS. Uh, and so we have a unique relationship with them uh, there because we, of course, want to push back ISIS as well. Uh, we have in Damascus, they are supporting uh, the Assad regime and have been major supporters of uh, Assad and making sure that he stays in power, and of course we've seen the hundreds of thousands of people that have died in that conflict. Uh, Beirut, Sana'a, uh, they are trying to exercise major influence in about four Arab capitals. And one of our challenges as we look at this agreement and how we make sure uh, once we find out all of the specific terms in it, uh, this is, Iran is not an easy partner to work with. In fact, some of their recent activities, uh, even as close as February 9th, Iran's nuclear chief announced that his country had developed a new generation of centrifuges that are 15 times more powerful than those currently being used to enrich uranium right now in Iran. Uh, later the same month, Iran's Navy conducted a simulated attack against a mock US aircraft carrier in the vicinity of the Strait of Hormuz and of course, that's one of the most important shipping lanes in the world that we have and our allies very important interests in ensuring that that remains free and secure. And there have been, over the history you can understand, uh, there have been much talked about in the news about uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israel's uh, concerns about Iran, uh, but they have previously said that they would like to wipe Israel off the map. And even as recently as March 21st, Iran's supreme leader has proclaimed death to America. Uh, in addition to 
the overt hostility that we've seen from Iran. Uh, if you look at some of the prior uh, behavior of Iran in 2004, President Rouhani, then Iran's National Security uh, Council Secretary, openly bragged that while we were talking to the Europeans in Tehran, we were installing equipment in parts of the facility in Isfahan. And so that's what we want to make sure does not happen uh, with any agreement that is entered into right now. And in fact, recently, the former deputy director of the International Atomic Energy Agency has said, if there's no undeclared installation today in Iran, it will be the first time in 20 years that Iran doesn't have one. And so Iran hasn't previously come clean as to what its facilities are for its nuclear program and what its weaponization program has been. And so this is the challenge as we walk into these neg negotiations that we've been in. And so you can understand um, that verification is incredibly important in all of this. And that the Congress and the United States Senate and our important role here, it's why we want to make sure um, that we perform our function too. A, a function that we have historically, when there have been major agreements that impact our foreign policy, that we have uh, a piece, a say in those agreements. And I think that's going to be the biggest issue that you see coming forward in the United States Senate right now in reaction to this agreement. And it's, it's really bipartisan in terms of that reaction. One of the things as, as this agreement unfolded, uh, from my perspective, I want to make sure that we deny Tehran a uranium or plutonium path to a bomb. I want to make sure that we dismantle Iran's illegal nuclear infrastructure and require Iran to comply with UN Security Council resolutions that have been in place. And a couple of issues that have not been in the table uh, in this agreement that are very important issues going forward that I think the Congress is going to want to know more about is what is Iran going to do to stop its activities that are destabilizing the region in terms of terrorism. Because as sanctions get lifted on the nuclear program, if, we, if this agreement uh, is fully goes forward in June and we're all able to see the terms, uh, they will have more money in their economy. I'd be happy to see that money spent for more schools and to help their economy. What I don't want to see, or any of us to see, is that money spent to support more terrorism in the region. The other issue that's incredibly important is they have been developing an intercontinental ballistic missile. And in fact, uh, the public estimates of when they'd be producing that is actually this year, 2015. They've recently launched a, made an attempt at a space launch, which would be one way that they could launch a nuclear weapon. And so this is another issue that hasn't been fully addressed or fleshed out. Uh, what do they intend to do with their missile program? And it's an important issue to us because you're here in Texas, but I live in the eastern part of the country. And uh, that would be the quicker target for Iran if they had ICBM capability. And so this is an important issue uh, to the American people. So based on what I have heard so far in this framework and read the four pages that the White House uh, puts out, um, the most important issue that I think is raised by it is how are we going to ensure that there is unfettered uh, access to Iran to ensure that whatever is agreed upon to, they comply with. Because this is, the history between us is not one of trust, and their prior behavior is not one of trust. And as I look at where we are, we need to have unfettered access. We need to be able to go into Iran, the international nuclear inspectors, without notice. And they need to be able to go wherever they want, whenever they want. Because anything short of that, it will be very difficult to make sure that Iran is complying with this agreement. And a couple of substantive concerns that I'd like to learn more about is that we've really moved the ball on the agreement. Uh, Henry Kissinger came before our committee recently, the Armed Services Committee, and I think he described it well. Um, he testified that negotiations with Iran have gone from denying Iran the capability to develop a, nu a, a military nuclear option to negotiations over the scope of that capability. 
He said that negotiations have gone from preventing proliferation to managing it. And I think that's evident by some of the terms that have been released because uh, Iran is going to be allowed a year breakout period in terms of the fissile material that they would be able to have in place to break out to a nuclear weapon um, in terms of their research and development. Uh, and I think that we should understand there are real concerns with not just ending their program but having a year breakout period. Why is that? It goes beyond whether Iran can just break out. It also goes to the reaction of what the other Arab nations in the region are going to do. And I can, I can tell you, um, having met with many of them and had meetings about their concerns about Iran, uh, they have said very plainly to us that if Iran is going to be allowed to keep some enriched uranium and be able to have this breakout period, we're gonna want the same because they are that concerned about Iran's attempts at regional domination. And so that's one worry we should all have because we want to end proliferation. We don't want everyone to sort of have, uh, we're all of a year out for, toward a nuclear weapon, uh, not only Iran, but other Sunni nations in the region. And so I think this is an issue that needs to be addressed with our Arab partners to ensure that we don't see more proliferation in the region. Another issue that needs to be addressed as well is that we originally went into this, if we look at the administration's initial position, uh, that they were talking about only having, allowing Iran to have about 500 to 1,000 centrifuges. They are still under this agreement going to be able to maintain uh, more than 6,000 centrifuges, centrifuges and some at one of their underground facilities. So this gets back to the point of verification. How do we make sure that our people or the United Nations inspectors can show up whenever they want to make sure that uh, what is being done with the program is actually consistent with this agreement? So if I could say anything else at the end of the day, that's where the devils are in the, de in the details. How will people be allowed to inspect this agreement? And I wanna turn it over to all of your question, but before I leave, I want to bring it back to the question of the constitutional role of the United States Senate and the Congress in all of this. Uh, we need a say in this, and why is that important? Because this is going to be, I would say, post-Cold War, one of the most important arms control agreements since the end of the Cold War. And Congress has a very important role in ensuring that this agreement is durable and that it's one that is adopted by the American people and lasts beyond this administration. Congress has a very important role in this because it was the Congress on a bipartisan basis that actually put the toughest sanctions in place. And we voted in many instances almost overwhelmingly 100 to, 100 to zero or 99 to one to put these sanctions in place. And so before they are removed, we have a constitutional role in ensuring uh, that the agreement is one that we think really protects the interests of the United States of America before these sanctions are removed. And so in the coming weeks, I think what you will see in the United States Senate, there is a bill that I was an early co-sponsor of, and it is being led uh, by Senator Corker from Tennessee. Uh, it was originally introduced Senator Corker, who's the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and the ranking member, uh, Senator Menendez, who's now stepped down but is still in the Senate. It has, um, it's, it has strong bipartisan support. We're very close on this bill to having a veto-proof majority. And all the bill says is that the Congress should have a 60-day period of review to decide whether of the agreement, once the terms are released, to decide whether or not the sanctions should be lifted uh, before the agreement is really finalized and adopted by the United States of America. And so to me, we have a constitutional role. I respect the, the president's constitutional role, uh, but I hope that we will be given a broader opportunity to review this agreement. And it can't be that the administration will go to the UN, but won't come to the United States Congress. Uh, that cannot be their position, and I hope that would not be their position going forward. But this will be the, uh, the biggest political 
and foreign policy issue that faces us for a long time in the United States Congress. And it is what you can expect to see uh, us on a bipartisan basis debating and pushing as we get back uh, after the recess. So I thank you for having me today. And I most of all want to answer your questions about whether it's Iran, uh, any other topic on your mind, because we certainly have a lot to talk about around the world. And again, I'm honored to be here with Admiral McRaven, uh, Admiral Inman, and all of you. I'm so impressed with what you're doing here at UT and looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. That's terrific. Have a seat and we'll uh, okay, have some We'll give Senator Ayotte a little break from standing on her feet for the Q&A time, and we'll do it, do it sitting down here. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions for, uh, for the senator, but then we'll turn it over to, to everyone here, since she does want to hear from you. So, uh, Senator, uh, following up on your closing comments there about the congressional role uh, in, uh, in Iran policy, particularly looking at this deal, can you uh, understand there's 100 different voices and minds in the Senate. Can you uh, predict for us a little bit what you think things will play out like in the next two or three months in the Senate, especially the question of, uh, of what role Democrats will be playing in scrutinizing sure. this and how much bipartisan support is there? Well, I actually think that there is quite a bit of bipartisan support. When we originally introduced the bill, um, there, it started with six Republicans. I was one of the original six Republicans, six Democrats, and it's been growing uh, support for the bill since then, um, including recently uh, Chuck Schumer agreed to co-sponsor it. And so I think what will end up happening the administration has said it would veto the bill, and that's why it's important to have a veto-proof majority. I think it's hard to say that you don't want to have a review of this, given that Congress really has played an important role in terms of the sanctions, and this is such an important arms control agreement for our national security. So my prediction is that we will get uh, the support to have uh, this legislation passed and that we will have an opportunity to review it. But then everyone at that point in the Senate uh, will look at um, the agreement and will look at the terms of it and make their, their own decision. And so I don't think that even if it's reviewed that, that it should be presumed that the Senate's going to reject this, at this agreement at all. Because make no mistake, I, I would like an agreement with Iran if it's one that we can trust and it's one we can verify. I don't want to have to trust them. I want us to be able to verify it independently. And I want to make sure that it's one that protects our interests in terms of ensuring that they don't have nuclear weapons capability. Great. And uh, to follow up as well on, you had mentioned uh, Israel and Israel's concerns about Iran. And any glance at the recent headlines has shown that uh, US-Israel relations are not in a very positive state right now overall. Uh, what can you tell us about how you think Israel might respond to this agreement with Iran? And then what role will Congress be playing on the U.S.-Israel relationship? So you've already, um, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been very skeptical of this agreement. And I mean, I share many of his concerns. Uh, but I think that in terms of what you've seen in the administration of the back and forth between Israel and the United States, I do not believe that this is going to be a lasting uh, you know, difference in our opinion uh, or a so-called lasting rift in our relationship with Israel. And the reason I say that is because we've had such a long history with Israel. And this history goes well beyond any president um, uh, or any prime minister, for that matter. And it's also been a very strong bipartisan history. Uh, we fight about so much in Congress, uh, but in terms of our relationship with Israel, we have been relatively unified on this. And so I think that the, the relationship with the Congress, the fact that it's so bipartisan, and even today, the president in his discussion of, of the, uh, the agreement talked, to, really acknowledged that uh, the importance of the relationship and reiterated that. So I think that shows you that that's going to endure beyond a, a disagreement now. And then uh, one final question for me before we turn it over to the uh, audience. Um, going back to the horrific news today from Kenya about these Al-Shabaab uh, attacks. Uh, and 
on the, you know, it's almost 14 years since 9-11. On the one hand, we're very blessed, and it's no accident that since then there hasn't been another large-scale terrorist attack on the United States. On the other hand, with Al-Shabaab, with the Islamic State, with these different Al-Qaeda franchises, with Director Clapper's recent testimony, we see that there is, uh, the terrorist threat is still out there, and it's, uh, it's evolved, it's metamorphized. Uh, how serious do you think the terrorist threat to the United States is today, and are we doing enough to address it? Well, I think the terrorist threat to the United States of America today is very grave. And I think that, uh, you know, I look at our special operators that Admiral McRaven led, um, the fact that what our special forces do around the world and our ability uh, to partner uh, with, with allies and, and get intelligence and break up these networks is so critical now, uh, because in some ways uh, we see terrorism on the march. And we see it in Yemen, we see it in Africa. Uh, we obviously see it very obviously with what's happening with ISIS trying to establish the Islamic Caliphate um, between Iraq and Syria. And, and we also see it with the number of Western foreign fighters that have flowed in to support ISIS. So um, at the end of the day, our challenges still remain, uh, I think, very great in this area. And one thing that I haven't talked about, but it's really important, is that we address resourcing our Department of Defense to connect with the challenges we're facing and our intelligence agencies, because we're facing automatic cuts already in 2016 called sequester. And if those go in place, we're going to undermine um, the efforts that we're trying to make to prevent a, another attack on our country. And we're gonna undermine our military and their ability to be prepared uh, for, uh, none of us wants to be involved in a conflict, but one of the surest things to invite conflict is if you're not prepared. Thanks, okay. I will right, we'll turn it over to the audience. I've got a boy, num number of hands going up, so um, let's see. All right, uh, Mark Jabelli right here. Uh, Charles is bring it down, right, thanks. Uh, thank you for being here, Senator. My name is Mark Jabelli, and I'm a senior um, here at UT, as well as a midshipman Naval ROTC unit. Um, I wanted to ask you about being prepared. Uh, this week, Secretary Carter outlined his Force for the Future initiative at Syracuse. Um, I was curious, given the sequester, um, his emphasis was on re recruiting and training the, the, right types of, uh, the right types of people, particularly in the, in the cyber field. Um, what are the force structure needs that you see, and how can we meet them? Um, and how does that all play in with the sequester? Um, thank you, and, and thank you for your service to our country. And this plays, let me just start with it, it plays into sequester in the sense that we want the best and the brightest to come and serve our nation, and especially as we look at the technology challenges we face. If you look at Cyber Command and being on the cutting edge of, of making sure that we can be prepared for cyber attacks against the country, and also be prepared if we need to have offensive capabilities there. We're gonna need the best and the brightest to do that. And we're competing against the Googles, and we're competing against all the tech companies where uh, they can, the best and the brightest can go and make a lot more money in, than serving in our military or intelligence agencies. But the reason I think that they would be willing and wanting to do it is because they wanna serve our country, they wanna make a difference, and in, our military and our intelligence agencies, they can make the biggest difference for our country, and I feel people are inspired by that. But sequester creates this um, place where we're failing to keep faith with people, where we're creating uncertainty that if I'm going to give up uh, what a career I could make it lucrative in the private sector to go and serve our nation, I wanna make sure that I'm gonna get the training that I need, I'm gonna make sure uh, that there's a career path for me that gives me an opportunity to, uh, to develop myself fully professionally. And when we cut the resources, that's what we are in a position where we'll cut training, where we'll cut uh, research and development on new technologies, and that's where people would be attracted to, to have an opportunity to work on these new technologies that, that uh, obviously are uh, scientists and mathema mathematicians and engineers. And so, all of that makes it less attractive. And then when it comes to retaining our force and recruiting our force, 
Um, if we keep talking about downsizing and we keep uh, putting ourselves in a position where the strain we put on our men and women in uniform, because right now I'm concerned that we're going to downsize, for example, the end strength of our army in a place where if we are involved in a conflict, we're going to send our men and women in uniform too often to war and not give them the time that they need, what's called dwell, to rest and to reju re rejuvenate. And that takes a lot out of people and families. And so it's hard to tell someone, come serve us, if we're not going to adequately give you the support and resources that they need. And so ultimately, we can come up with any weapon system in the world, but guess what the most valuable thing we have? It's people. People are what makes us and makes our military the best in the world. And if you strain your people and you don't tell them that you're committed resource-wise, um, that's how you undermine our ability to defend the nation and to attract the best people to come and serve. All right. Uh, yes, right here on the end. Uh, yes, Senator, you've done a great job of uh, detailing all the specifics of U.S. foreign policy uh, by focusing on the trees. My question is about the forest. Uh, isn't the Judeo-Christian West now engaged in a class of civilization with the Islamic world? And uh, if you agree with that, isn't it true that we in the Judeo-Christian West are, deserve a lion's share of the blame for that by invading Iraq, invading Afghanistan, and basically, I mean, even... If we go back 20 years ago to uh, Yugoslavia, the, the former Yugoslavia, wasn't it the Christian Serbs who committed genocide against the Muslims and the Bosnian, Bosnian Muslims uh, during that time? So couldn't you really argue that ISIS and Al-Shabaab, aren't they really the bastard children of Western and U.S. interventions over the last 25 years? Yeah, I, I don't agree with you there on that. Um, because I, 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 we're not a perfect nation. But we have done more to provide freedom and opportunity for people around the world than any other country. What other country would go um, into a country and, and free people and allow them to thrive and want nothing back in return from it. Um, it, it seem, and, and, and have our people, uh, you know, obviously sacrifice so much in doing so. So I do believe in the fundamental goodness of America. Um, not that we don't make mistakes and we don't have challenges. When I look at groups like ISIS, I look at groups like Al Qaeda, I don't necessarily um, view it as ultimately a religious war. But I do believe it that they are using religion um, and looking at Islam a, uh, in a radical way that I don't think is consistent with what peace-loving uh, peace Muslims would support for their religion. And they're warping uh, that, and they're using that religion to motivate people uh, to commit gravely evil, evil acts. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think that uh, you can say our behavior created this level of evil in any way. Um, but I do know one thing that we need to band together, uh, Christians and Muslims, to stand up to this evil because more, more Muslims have died under the hands of groups like, we, we need to, can't forget this. I mean, more Muslims have died under the, the hands of groups like, uh, you know, ISIS and Al Qaeda and, uh, Al-Shabaab and all of these groups uh, than, than Christians even. And uh, so I think that we have interests aligned and that we need to partner and defeat this evil and provide, allow people to live peacefully um, in freedom. So, so I think that we have an indispensable role in doing that and uh, we, should, we should really be working with people and leading coalitions to defeat these groups. Uh, yes, right here, uh, Charles. Please. Uh, my question is a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, you recently chaired with Senator Booker a rather entertaining panel on the question of drones. 
And we had an incident. We did. Yeah. We had an incident on campus where a student was flying a drone over the stadium and was detained, but basically without charge. And so I was curious now, as some time's passed and you've gotten answers more fully in writing, um, if you would comment on it, on the ways that we might be able to modernize our frameworks with the FAA mm -hmm. in order to maintain competitiveness with the Japanese or other European countries. So we had, I, I serve on the Commerce, Science, and um, Transportation Committee, and we had, and I'm the chair of the Aviation Subcommittee, so we had a hearing recently on unmanned uh, air systems, aircraft systems, and it, this is, the technology is moving so quickly uh, that we're behind. The FAA has recently issued proposed rules on the commercial use of these uh, unmanned aircraft and how they should be used appropriately. But there's a number of things, they're moving fairly slowly, and there's a number of things that aren't addressed in those rules. So we're actually still in the information gathering process from that hearing. We haven't actually gotten all the answers yet, so we can get together as a committee. But I think there's a lot of bipartisanship in ensuring that we come up with a framework that protects the safety of uh, obviously um, our, our air in terms of making sure there's, there's uh, safety for, for the use of, of drones and other uh, unmanned aircraft systems so they don't collide with commercial aircraft, all that. That's a basic. And then we also have to address the privacy issue on how people use, um, use drones. And so, so we don't have all the answers yet. That was the first hearing. And I think uh, we're going to work. This is a great, you know, you wonder about bipartisanship in Washington. This is one we're going to all work together on and just try to come up uh, with a good framework and move as quickly as possible. And we're going to definitely put a fire underneath the agency because they're moving way too slowly on this. Our, our, in Europe, they're just way ahead of us on, on allowing this new technology to be used properly. I will say to that, uh, Chancellor McRaven, when you came here, you probably thought you were getting away from drone policy, leaving Socon <laughs> behind. But little did you know that drones on campus would be one of the Yes, just, okay, well, right, and then there was one, remember, that landed on the White House lawn, so that wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, that's right, so, okay, all right. Uh, let's see, uh, the gentleman in the blue here, it's Larry O'Brien Steele, if you can get it over to Larry. So. Thank you, Senator. I'm Larry O'Brien, a PhD student at the UT LBJ School. Uh, my question is back on Iraq, or sorry, on Iran. And you mentioned a fundamental point in your comments, which is it seems as if we've gone to a path of trying to manage Iran's pathway to nuclear weapon capability. But it seems if we go back two or three years, the increased, um, uh, uh, increased efforts that were made to prevent Iran from achieving nuclear weapon capability, the, the sanctions regime put right. in place by Congress, UN, other agencies, was really more of a preventative measure mm -hmm. than a management measure. Yet it appears to the public that the administration has perhaps embraced the notion that it can only be a management to a nuclear weapons capability over a certain period of time. When did that fundamental change occur and if it hasn't been adequately addressed or explained to the public, has it at least been addressed or explained and discussed with Senate and congressional leadership? Um, it, Larry, go ahead and keep the mic, because the gentleman next to you had a question, too. We'll get to you next So time. I think it is a fundamental change. And let me just say, the Congress, uh, we had a resolution before the Congress on what our policy should be. And we rejected a containment policy from, it was a vote of 99 to 1 in the United States Senate. So we, I, think our, I think our goals have shifted. And I don't know the administration. They clearly shifted in these negotiations. And I think it started first with the interim agreement, because what we agreed up front in the interim agreement set the tone in terms of what we were going to get for a final agreement of really freezing versus dismantling when we lifted the initial sanctions. And so that's when I think the the, the, the moment was where there was a, a shift in decision making there. Um, I have not yet had a good explanation from the administration why, uh, but that is really the shift that we've seen in this. And that makes people like me more worried about it because um, ultimately that puts more pressure on the verification piece because if they're going to be allowed to break out, they're going to be allowed, we're, we're really managing their ability and how quickly they can spin up to it. That makes verification even more important. And this is a regime that's been quite challenging to ensure that we have proper verification. And so when I look at the details of the agreement, 
I've read the four page framework today. It doesn't describe how the IAEA will be allowed in and when they're allowed in and whether Iran has a say in it. I believe that Iran should have no say in it and it should be literally spot inspections. Otherwise, we're gonna have a hard time uh, understanding that containment will protect our interests. Uh, so that's where I, I see things currently. And I think other national security experts have raised that to us as well, that, the, that this has really shifted. And if you look at where we are though with sanctions, we are at, uh, because of oil prices, we actually have a lot of leverage right now. Uh, we, we've had more leverage than we've had in, in a long time, just economically of the impact, particularly of the, the uh, energy sanctions, to make sure that there's some, some real there there in whatever we come, come up with. Yes, as a follow-up, um, once again, thank you very much for being here today. We, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks. But as a follow-up to his question, uh, based on the, both the rhetoric and the actions uh, of the leadership in Iran, the statements that they've made, et cetera, and the fact that they, they say that the continuation of Israel is not a negotiable issue and death to America, et cetera, how? How can we trust them with anything that they say, whether it's a framework or whether it's mm -hmm. specifics? And their, their religion tells them that it's perfectly okay to lie to us because we're infidels. Yeah, I think this is a real issue and that's why how verification occurs, who does it, how it's done, and whether the Iranians have any say in it is very crucial details that have not been described or laid out yet. And I think these will be that Congress will hone in on that on both sides of the aisle with like a laser focus because we can agree to a lot of different things. We could even end, agree to end their program, which is where I'd like to be, uh, dismantle it fully, but um, without knowing that it happens and knowing that it continues, it, the agreement really becomes um, not worth, worthless without the verification piece. Admiral Inman. Admiral. The good fortune of not having an attack inside the country since 9-11. Yes. Uh, a lot of that's depended on very skillful work by the FBI, yes. enabled by NSA. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding the way the media treated Snowden revelations, both chairman of Senate and House committees, Republican, Democrat, were explicit. There was no violation of U.S. law in any of that activity. Now, one of the principal laws is gonna expire the end of May. Mm -hmm. What are the prospects of that being renewed in this Congress? So Admiral, I think first of all, uh, you know, I think we, we have to understand the damage, oh yeah, you understand well uh, the damage that Snowden did and um, he is a traitor. And, and the damage he did is, is very significant to not only um, our security interests, but people who work with us, most importantly, and, and so that they can work in safety with us. Um, I think that their, that program will be reauthorized, uh, but I think that they'll be probably ensuring within the means of protecting um, our ability to in, in gather intelligence, uh, more oversight, and which I know there has been oversight, but that will probably be enhanced. And uh, in any way that we can have transparency without undermining the program, I think that those are the two things, that the Congress will make some changes. But I do believe that the program, uh, I mean, look what's happening around the world right now. I, I think for us not to uh, reauthorize uh, that program would be very much to the detriment of our ability to gather intelligence in a way that keeps our nation safe at a very dangerous time around the world. Um, you know, the, but, the, but those two pieces I mentioned, I think will be discussed robustly. Uh, yes, um, right back out here in the, in, the, in the white shirt, I'd steal go up about six rows next to the guy in the blue, sorry. Sarah, is that you? Yeah. 
I'm sorry, I, my glasses aren't working, so it's one of my students. I'm a horrible professor. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. I, the glare, anyway. Hi, so, all right, so I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah Kaiser Cross. I'm a graduate student at the LBJ School in Global Policy, and I also study Middle Eastern Studies. Um, so, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the strategic importance of U.S. presence in the Middle East, kind of balanced with uh, U.S. national values. I was wondering how you approach balancing strategic partners like Saudi Arabia and their controversial human rights policies mm -hmm. with US national values. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, do you think we've been successful in these approaches? And if not, uh, perhaps all offering some alternatives. And Senator, I'll say Sarah interned for our embassy in Bahrain last summer, so she uh, knows of what she speaks. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> by the way, having, having interned in Bahrain, uh, you can understand that this is another air, uh, country we need to keep a focus on because uh, Iran has some activities already to destabilize leadership in Bahrain, and this will be another country that is sort of a, a marker in, in some of the activities that they can have in the region that could also engage uh, other Arab nations to so you could see Bahrain becoming an issue. Um, I think that this is a challenge for us, and it's a big challenge. But I think that we need to always state clearly our values and what we stand for. And I, I think, I, I, I myself think about it in the context of how women are treated in the Middle East. And if you look at uh, some of the you know, partners that we have in the Middle East, uh, some of them are, are not uh, protective or respectful of, protect, of uh, all human rights, and especially the rights of women, as we are in this country. And so I, there's no doubt that we need to have relationships with them, but I also think we need to clearly speak the truth to them on our values and, and not be hesitant to be vocal about uh, things that they do that are detrimental to human rights and to our values. And I think we can always do better at that. I think we can be stronger voices on that, um, but it's, it's obviously not, not, not always easy uh, to, to, to be able to try to ensure that we're dealing with a group like ISIS or working with Saudi Arabia on places where we can partner, but also we want to call them out on you know, the way that they uh, treat women uh, the, and, and issues of religious freedom. Those are all important in those areas. And it's, it's not, it's not a, an easy question, but it's an important question. We can't forget who we are and what we stand for. And that doesn't end at the water's edge. In fact, I think we have, you know, one thing that was just really amazing to hear we had the president of Afghanistan come uh, speak to the joint session of Congress recently. And before 9-11, no girl was educated in Afghanistan. And now, you know, 60% of girls are being educated in Afghanistan. And so we can have a very important influence on other countries around the world in standing up for human rights. Uh, yes, uh, this gentleman, the blue suit right here. Thank you very much for being with us, Senator. My name is Dan Przbilski, former uh, lecturer here at the university, corporate executive in the past. My concern is that the strength of our nation has been based on the rule of law, extended from the Constitution. And our form of government was supposedly founded on a balance of power. We've seen that abandoned over the last eight years, where the balance of power is ignored, rule of law is ignored, and I think this is a major security issue to our nation and our future. If you could comment on that, please. And this will be our final question. Uh, okay. <laughs> because of the clock, not because of the question. Come on. All right. So, all right. So that's where I, I mean, I, I firmly believe uh, we have obviously a government that is based on checks and balances. And that is very important that those checks and balances operate. We may not always like the results of those checks and balances, um, but that's how our system was set up. And, it's, it, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else or under any other system. And so, you know, I have to say that there have been times when I've been very disappointed in this president in terms of things that he has tried to do unilaterally that really Congress does have a role. And I hope that his veto message, for example, on this legislation, 
that would allow Congress to say in this important, important arms control agreement um, that has grave national security interests for our nation. Uh, I hope that that's just rhetoric and that he will understand that we do have an important role in this and will respect it. And if not, we'll just have to get enough votes to make it veto-proof majority. That's the way our system works. But you raise a very good uh, point, and all of us have to be respectful of that. The president has an important role as commander-in-chief. I respect that. But I also have a role representing my constituents, um, serving on the Armed Services Committee and, and having a vote on important matters that impact our foreign policy. And so I have to perform my role as well for the people of this country. Okay, all right, and with that, we're gonna to have to adjourn, but please join me in thanking Senator Ayotte. So, all right, so, all right. You were terrific, thank you so much.